My name is Juliana Nicolasian with the Oklahoma State University Library. Today is Monday, March 16, 2009, and I am in Oklahoma City interviewing Nancy Coates. This interview is being conducted as part of the Oklahoma Women's Hall of Fame Oral History Project. Nancy Coates was inducted into the Oklahoma Women's Hall of Fame in 2005. Thank you for joining us today. You're welcome. Well, let's begin by learning a little bit more about you. If you could just give us a snapshot into your early life growing up. I was born in Ohio, and my family, which consisted of my mother and father and an older brother and a younger brother, moved to Phoenix, Arizona when I was eight. So I went to public school in Phoenix and then to high school at West Phoenix High School. From there, I went to college in Los Angeles at Occidental College, then to the University of Arizona in Tucson, from which I graduated. I then entered the law school at the University of Arizona, where I completed two years before moving to Oklahoma and finishing at OU, my last year of law school. So I've been a lawyer all my life. Now, when going back to your elementary school, middle school, high school days, were your schools really large or quite small? My schools were large. Okay. And during those early days, what were some of your favorite subjects? You know, I saw that question on the little form that you sent, and I, I don't know that I had a favorite subject, but I do know that I worked hard at all the subjects because it was important to get good grades. I can't say that I really loved history or some other course. I just was interested in getting good grades and a scholarship so that I could go to college. And when you were younger, did you have aspirations to be a lawyer or did you want to be something else? Interesting enough, in the eighth grade, I wrote a career paper as law is my career. I had never met a lawyer. I didn't, you know, I don't think there were even any television shows that featured lawyers at that time. But I remember seeing on the news uh, pictures of people in front of the United States Capitol, and they were lawyers, and they carried attache cases. And I thought, those are people that make things happen, and I'd like to be one. Of course, there weren't any women in those pictures. But I um, went through high school, still thinking maybe I could go to law school. But that wasn't something that was encouraged in the 1950s. I went through college getting a degree in education, thinking that I would go back to my home in Phoenix and my, live with my parents, save my money while I was teaching, and then maybe I could go to law school. But as it worked out, after getting my teaching degree, I got a small graduate fellowship, which enabled me to enter law school and um, to see if I liked it and if it liked me, and I stayed, finished law school. Now, were there a lot of women when you entered law school in your classes? No. There actually was one other woman in my first year class at the University of Arizona Law School. And then when I graduated, there was one other woman in my graduating class. So we were definitely in the minority. And why the switch to OU? I married an Oki. Mm -hmm. So I transferred here. Okay. And I've been here more or less ever since. I like Oklahoma a lot. So let's talk a little bit about what happens after law school. What did you go on to do? Well, I tried to find a job as a lawyer, which wasn't easy if you were a woman at that time. Um, law firms thought you might get pregnant, and how could you represent a client if you were expecting a baby? Those were the times that even school teachers were asked to give up teaching after they were three months pregnant. So it was not easy to find a job as a lawyer. I was fortunate that I found a job as a federal law clerk. And I did that up until my first child was born in 1966, and then subsequently had a second child in 1968. So I was um, home as a mother when my children were young. In 1972, I was hired as the first woman lawyer for Southwestern Bell Telephone Company in the five-state area 
of Southwestern Bell Telephone. And that's Arkansas, Texas, Missouri, Kansas, and Oklahoma. So that was an interesting experience too. It's not always pleasant or easy to be the first. What were some of your early challenges upon accepting that job? Um, I don't think that you, or at least I, was not in a position to get any help from a mentor or anyone because there were no women who were at the same level that I was in the legal department. Um, I did find, though, that I had a very understanding boss, and from time to time I noticed that if a case came into our office where we were being sued out of Muskogee or somewhere, he would give that case to one of the men so that I wouldn't have to travel out of town. And in a way, that really was a favor to me because I would be juggling babysitters and child care and leaving early in the morning to be at a motion dock at Muskogee at nine was a bit of a challenge. So I thought that he really kind of looked after me and I appreciated that. And then also juggling family, probably pretty tough. Yes, that was not an easy thing to do. And you know, it sounds like the old ages and it was, but... In 19, the early 1970s, when I was practicing law, there were no wardrobes for professional women. It was very uh, challenging to find clothing that was not too masculine and not too feminine, but just right. We've come a long way in those lines now because there are so many career clothing lines for women who are professionals. Now, out of your work with Southwestern Bell here in Oklahoma, you eventually moved to Washington, D.C. I Can did. Can you touch upon that for me a little bit? I accepted a job offer um, at that time with AT&T. We were one big Bell system, and it was um, not uncommon to get a rotational assignment in Washington or New York. And when that opportunity became available... Um, in 1982, I took a job in the Washington, D.C. office. It was an interesting time because as soon as I got there, that antitrust case against the Bell system was resolved and the baby Bells were born. So I was part AT&T, but then I watched as SBC and Bell South and Pacific Telesis and Ameritech emerged in the Washington environment each setting up their own Washington Public Affairs Office. So I switched then from AT&T. I had the opportunity to go with the new SBC Washington office. And that was an interesting time to be there during that evolution of the, as they called them, the baby bears, which now we've come full circle, as you know. And after five years in Washington, um, being a sort of a lobbyist, you would... Um, interact with some of the staff people on the Hill or do uh, attend committee hearings to monitor certain legislation and then feed that information back to your headquarters, which for us was St. Louis at that time. But in 1987, I had an opportunity to return to Oklahoma and at that time called SBC. And I finished out my career with the Bell System. Now, did your family move with you to D.C.? Um, my son moved up there with me and started high school. My daughter stayed and finished high school here in Oklahoma City. Okay. Never easy decision, but it was not any different for a woman than it was for a man because I remember hearing a colleague of mine who worked for Ameritech, and when he moved in from Chicago to the Washington office, his teenage daughter told him, you've ruined my life. And, it, you know, it's hard on families, and I think in the long run, she appreciated the opportunity after she adjusted in a new high school, but it's a plus and minus situation for children, I think. So after you retire from SBC here in Oklahoma, what did you go on to do? Um, I was at a point in uh, my career with the Bell System that they were downsizing and offering uh, company buyouts and um, 
you'd hear a lot of rumors and then you'd ha have a flurry of people retiring. And when the right time came and the right offer was made, I thought that it would be a good time to leave, but I wanted to have something else to do. And I, I took a leave of absence and ran for district judge and got elected the end of 1994 and was sworn in in 1995. Now, did you ever think you would see yourself in that position as a judge or were you just happy and content being a lawyer? I um, didn't really have aspirations to become a judge, but I always admired those who were on the bench and I certainly admire them more now that I've been there because it's a, it's a very challenging place to be where you're making those decisions that, that affect people's lives so critically. So how did you campaign? Uh, the first time you were elected? In 1994, when I was running, um, my particular position for which I was running was a county-wide seat. So we had to cover the entire county, which meant signs going up all over and having teams that would come and build your signs. And then you'd have them place the signs. You'd also um, do flyers and mailings. I had a wonderful friend who had been president of the um, Nurses Association, and she sent a postcard to all of the Oklahoma nurses who belonged to the association, and you would try to just have someone recommend you to people that you thought might be voters. In addition, we did some television time as well. So there were five candidates, and um, then I was in a runoff. There were two of us, and I was successful in getting the most votes. Cool. And were you running against males or females? I was running against males. Okay. Oh, actually in the runoff, there was one other female. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, in when you were uh, sworn in as district judge, you did some amazing things during your almost 10 years on the bench. Um, can we talk a little bit about how the drug court came about, uh, came about. And it's the mental health court mm. that I was involved in. Um, I had been a volunteer with the Mental Health Association for a number of years. And I believe it was because of that association with the Mental Health Association that I was offered an opportunity to attend um, the National Judicial College course on co-occurring disorders. At that conference, I met some judges who had established mental health courts in their jurisdictions. And it was um, such a inspiring thing for the courts to answer what was such a need in the community for those people who had mental health issues but got involved in the criminal justice system. So when I came back from that course, I said, we need to start one of these in Oklahoma. And I was fortunate enough to have cooperation from the attorney um, who represented the district attorney's office and one from the public defender's office and other people in the community that knew that there were people who were in the mental health um, area but got crossed into the judicial system because of some minor infraction, and they needed treatment and not jail time. So we had a catalyst of people that were supportive and volunteers. We worked at our lunch hour, putting together the documentation we needed, collecting forms from other jurisdictions that had a mental health court, and we started one in Oklahoma County. And did you see that many states were going down this road, or I believe Oklahoma was, was right up there among the first? There were about seven others um, in the United States that I was aware of at that time. It's my understanding that the one we established in Oklahoma County was the first one in the Southwest. Since that time, in Oklahoma alone, I think there are at least a dozen mental health courts. Well, going back to your, your days on the bench, are there any trials that just stand out in your memory? 
as those wow trials that you were involved with? I think um, the most memorable were those that uh, I presided over on the criminal docket. It's just such an education, I think, for those of us that don't come into contact with the people who are involved in committing crimes, whether they are assaults or drive-by shootings or murders. Um, those cases are most memorable. Now we learn uh, the skills we need for our professions in different places. Can you, can you tell me uh, some of the most important places where, where you learned the background you needed for your career? Well, I'm not sure that anything in particular, I think life experiences in general help you relate to people in situations. Um, I, I, I don't know of any particular course that I took. Um, I was pleased that I had as much uh, trial experience as I had before I took the bench so that I could sympathize with the lawyers who were there because I, I do have a real empathy for them that they are representing a client, that they are on the clock, so to speak, and that we don't want to waste their time. So it made me, I think, be very cognizant of being on time, starting my court on time, ending on time, taking breaks at a predict predictable period so that the lawyers would not have additional stress. Um, I don't know that that made me any better as a judge, but I just was very aware of that. Uh, we, we touched uh, upon it a little bit uh, with your early law school experience, but tell me about any stumbling box or adversity that you faced along the way. I just think it was difficult being um, a woman at that time and going into what was traditionally a man's field. When I started law school, I think some of the fellows wondered why I was there and suspected I was there to find a lawyer husband. I heard comments like, don't you feel guilty? Being here, taking up the space of a, a young man that might need to have a career to support his family. Um, I, I think at first they didn't take me seriously. I was very serious about it. I was not there for any fun and games. It was just um, pretty challenging and I needed to put my head down and do the best that I could so that I could graduate. I also was looking forward to having a career and supporting my family. I think it's so common nowadays when in law schools, at least half the, the students are women. So it's so different now. Were the instructors accommodating? Um, I, I think that they were a little skeptical of my being there. It was just different for them. I'm not sure they welcomed the change. Did you tend to sit at the front of the class or towards the back of the class? I tried to sit in the middle and be in, 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 invisible if I could be. <laughs> <laughs> it was traditional in most criminal law classes that if there was a woman in the class, you would be called upon to brief, stand up, and report on the rape case. That was the first one in your book. Um, so there was, um, I, I think, additional limelight on you when you didn't really welcome it, but it's, it, it was okay. I made it through. There was some difficulty, like I mentioned, in hiring a woman lawyer at that time. Mm -hmm. And I can remember one time being interviewed at a law firm. And after the interview was over, this senior partner said, well, sweetie, if it was up to me, I'd hire you in a minute. But who would you go to lunch with? And I thought a minute, I thought, is this a trick question? And so if you don't know the answer, you repeat the question. And I said, let's see, who would I go to lunch with? And he said, well, you couldn't go with the secretaries because you're a lawyer. And you couldn't go with us lawyers because our wives wouldn't like it. And there were a few of those kind of unfortunate experiences. Were you happy as a law clerk and not as... Oh, yes. Being a law clerk for a federal judge was a wonderful opportunity to start 
my legal career. I thought I was very fortunate. I worked for a couple of good judges and um, gained the experience behind the scenes of knowing what a federal judge does with respect to trials and briefs and helping the judge draft the orders in cases. It was a good experience. Well, we've talked about adversity. adversity. Let's talk about highlights. Um, Tell me, you know, a couple of those key moments in your career that, that you consider some of your biggest highlights. Of course, if you are trying a case for your company and representing a corporation, which was always a target, if you were successful in a lawsuit, those are memorable. And I had a couple of those that I thought were significant cases. And at that time, when we were one bell system and it covered the whole United States, your company policy had to be established at the headquarters and then carried out in each of the states. So occasionally if I were doing a labor arbitration case or something similar where company policy was involved, you had to make sure that you were speaking the same public policy in one state that you were in another um, so that you were consistent with how you enforce the benefit plan, for example. Occasionally, you had an opportunity to win a big case that went all the way up to AT&T headquarters. And I remember getting a letter back from the general attorney congratulating me on a case that I, an arbitration case where I was successful. Um, that's always kind of a nice thing. The only other highlight, I think, when I was on the bench, um, it was a wonderful opportunity that I had to help establish the mental health court. So I'd say that was my most significant highlight as a, as a judge. Well, I'm sure it, it definitely changed a lot of lives and kept a lot of people out of the system and got them their much needed help that they needed. I think it did. Mm -hmm. Let's turn now to the Oklahoma Women's Hall of Fame. And I must say, um, I have your Hall of Fame file sitting in my office. And it had the most touching letter from your daughter, like just really touching. Um, when you were notified that you were going to be inducted into the Hall of Fame, what was going through your mind at that time? I don't recall anything um, other than being quite happy to be selected. And um, the fact that I could do it as a partner with my daughter was very special. And did you attend the ceremony that year? I did. Okay. And she attended as well. And let's see, back in 90, 2005, they, I'm pretty sure they had presenters then. Do you remember who presented you at the ceremony? I think my daughter did. Okay. So tell me what type of, uh, what this type of honor means to you. I just think that it's a wonderful experience to be included with some of those women who have done wonderful things in their lives. And um, it is a quite moving experience to see the other women who are inducted and to hear the presentations made. And I was just delighted to be a part of it. And your daughter went on to become a lawyer? Eventually? She, she has been a lawyer. Yes. Mm -hmm. She was a lawyer at that time as well. And, um, you know, reading that letter, for me, it was touching because, you know, she really looked at you uh, as a big role model uh, in her life. Um, how do you feel that now people look at you as that role model? I uh, think that maybe I was at one time, but I only because I was one of the first women who were in law school, although there had been women for, for several years. Um, it was still unusual at that time. So if I was any kind of a role model, it was because of the fact that there just were not that many women in the legal profession. Would you like to make mention of, of anybody who has helped play uh, an important role in your life? Um, I think I... I'm just grateful for my parents and how they um, gave me an opportunity growing up that I was kind of a typical middle class without some of the traumas that a lot of people face 
I think I appreciate that more now that I am older. Were they very encouraging uh, with your education? Um, I would say they they were not discouraging. It was not, um, I think I sort of outran them mm -hmm. in my aspirations. What would be your advice to women who plan on following in your footsteps? Um, I think that would be very presumptuous of me to think that I could give advice to any of these young women who are entering the legal profession because they are so accomplished now and so sharp that it, and so highly skilled technically that um, I don't think that I would have any, any advice to give. They could probably give me advice. Now, you've been very involved in the uh, Oklahoma Bar Association, holding many posts throughout the years. Um, how has that been uh, played a, a role in your, your life as a lawyer and later as a judge? Well, I just think that if you're in any profession, that there is something that you need to give back. And my representations of leadership are on the boards of... Um, the Oklahoma Federal Bar Association or the Oklahoma Bar Foundation were my efforts to just make a contribution to my profession, to strengthen it if I could. And in addition, you've always uh, been pretty involved in the community as well. Yes, I, I, I have been. I've enjoyed that. It's a way of um, not just being a lawyer, but reaching out and experiencing other people and what they were involved in in the community. And what are some of the groups you're involved with? Well, currently I'm on the board of the Oklahoma City Community Foundation, which uh, gives a lot of help through scholarships and different community projects, through donations from people, annuities that they establish at the Community Foundation. Um, in addition, I'm um, active in a book club. I like reading a lot and um, keeps me in touch with people who read things that I wouldn't normally read and they recommend books that keeps me involved in areas that are um, very stimulating. Um, my husband and I are active in our home. We also, he and I, um, tutor at a middle school here in Oklahoma City and I find that challenging. So you're staying pretty busy in retirement. Um, it's a nice pace, it is. It's nice not to have to work through your lunch hour and read briefs and be confronted with lawyers that are there. Um, I just, I loved being on the bench for the 10 years that I was there, but I um, also appreciate being retired. What does, I know you're a transplant Oklahoma, Oklahoman. Uh, what does Oklahoma mean to you? Hmm. Well, it's home. I appreciate um, the size of Oklahoma City and the size of the state. I think especially at this time when so many states are economically challenged, I appreciate the fact that Oklahoma has seems to have control over its budget and um, it has the rainy day fund for emergencies. And although we're um, not a wealthy state, we seem to be a state that offers a lot to the people who live here and the quality of life that they have. Well, when history is written about you, because one day it may be, we don't know, uh, what would you like for it to say? Um, I just find that difficult to believe. Um, so I don't know what. I, I, I guess I would like for it to say that I was um, responsible, honorable, and a, sort of a pioneer in my profession. Um, that's, I don't know that that's any sense of accomplishment, but it's been a good life for me, and I've enjoyed it. Well, is there anything you'd like to say that, that I have not touched upon today? Anything you'd like to add? No, I don't believe so. You seem to cover quite a bit. Okay. Well, we do appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. For well, Juliana, thank you. All right. We appreciate it.